Hi, welcome to CEO Chat. My name is Al Sini. I'm Joe Asamendi. And our uh, guest host today is Dave Bookbinder of Eisner Amper, business valuation consultant. And our guest, we're speaking with Cheryl Hunter from Los Angeles, California. Cheryl is an internationally recognized best selling author, expert coach, and uh, a a particularly expert in certain fields of coaching that could be especially valuable to CEOs and business owners. So, welcome, Cheryl, Cheryl, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to have you. Hey, Cheryl. I'm happy to be here. Thank okay. you. Cheryl, why don't we open with what we know is a, a core aspect of your value proposition at the Hunter Group, and that is resilience. I can't think of a more relevant conversation for business owners than how to pick yourself back up after you've fallen down. So maybe you can start by talking about resilience, what it is, and how you develop those skills. Absolutely. So resilience, I, I, it, they, they say that there's only a few certainties, death and taxes, right, those two, but I think change is another big one. Mm -hmm. And there's change and challenges, adversity, things of this nature, and we're not prepared by and large to face those. And so we get knocked down, so there, hence resilience it really comes in handy. But resilience isn't something that's inherently there or you get, or, or it's not, like when you kind of won the resilience motto or you didn't. It's something that can be developed like a skill. And it's traditionally been looked at as the ability to get back up quickly when you've been knocked down. Mm -hmm. But because it's a real area of passion for me and study, I like to keep it as a live inquiry. So I keep inquiring into, well, what else is resilience? And one of the things I've been musing on of late is that there really is what I like to call Resilience 2.0, which mm -hmm. is all about not getting knocked down quite so easily. Finding ways to buoy oneself up, you know, oneself or one's organization, right? Mm -hmm. And finding ways to make ourselves more pliable, have more grit, and withstand the changes and challenges and adversity and things that would take somebody out normally. So that's, that, those are some of the things that I hold true to about resilience. Well, and you know, I, I imagine that you've learned some of these lessons from your own experience. Maybe you could tell us just a little bit about, about your background. Absolutely. Uh, I didn't start out to be a, you know, an expert in resilience, but it was through my own path that I, that I found that I ultimately wanted to specialize in that. Mm -hmm. I like all of us, and my life has taken a circuitous path, but I started out as a teenager, I, I grew up in a little mountain town high in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado on a horse ranch, and it was fabulous and idyllic as a little kid, but as a teenager, I just wanted to get out of there and see the world and meet people, frankly, I wasn't related to by blood. Mm. So I concocted a plan along with my best friend, we were gonna go to Europe, and my plan was, while I was there, I was gonna somehow figure out a way to stay in the city. Mm. And no sooner did we get to France than a man with a camera around his neck approached me, asked me if I was a model. Mm. Told me he could make me one if I just went off with him and his friend. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like perhaps not the best idea, but I thought this could really help me stay in the big city, whatever the big city was, you know, mm -hmm. anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so I went with him. And it doesn't take a lot to figure out. They were not, in fact, photographers. They were criminals. Hmm. And they abducted me, drugged me, and you can fill in the gory details with your own mind, but hmm. eventually they left me for dead. They dumped me in a park in Nice, France. Hmm. And it was at that point that the real fight for my life began. I'd never dealt with anything like that. And it was incumbent upon me to figure out how to live now. And, the, you know, initially, as, as a teenager, you know, I was 18 when they took me, I, I had to figure out how to survive and the way I figured out to do that was just never let anybody know because I, I felt like I was harboring this deep dark secret. Not only was I traumatized by it, but there was also these things that anyone would know if they found out what happened. They would think I was broken, soiled, ruined, whatever. Sure. And so how I coped was simply not telling anybody what happened. Now I did decide to go ahead and become a model anyway Mm -hmm. And I was very successful. I was, you know, the worldwide Coca-Cola girl. I was in every major magazine franchise. I lived in Great. seven countries all over the world. But I applied what I was learning about resilience to do that. 
I became fascinated with the study of freedom because after they let me go, I felt more captive than ever. And it was, I was flummoxed by it. Sure. I thought, I'm free. I should be on top of the world. The world is my oyster, right? I should be happy-go-lucky. You hear about people getting a second mm. shot at life, and they're like, oh, I'm going to go bungee jumping. <laughs> Every right. day is a new adventure. Uh-huh. Yay, I'm so happy. And I was anything but. I was shut down. I felt like I splintered off from myself. And I was captive. And far more captive than I had been when they literally had me constrained. And what I learned on the journey back was that captivity and all that implies is part of the human condition. Once we face adversity that's bigger than we know how to cope with, we right. shut down. Okay, now like it is as though part of us splinters off and we become stuck. Yeah. And so I decided I'm not just going to crack that for myself, but I'm going to crack it for, crack the code on that for humankind. Oh. Well, Cheryl, we're coming up with a break, but but a thought we have we have about a minute in this segment. A thought crossed my mind. This is essentially you help people overcome some of the baggage of their past so that it doesn't ruin their future. Isn't that right? Precisely. Okay. That is, I think right, that's so that we can chart our own course into the future. That is for any CEO, for anybody who owns or runs a business, that is such a valuable lesson. And when we come back after this break, Charles, I know Dave Bookbinder has a few questions. You've collaborated with him. We'll explore some of that when we come back after this break on CEO Chat with Cheryl Hunter. Welcome back to CEO Chat. My name is Al Cini. My name is Joe Asamendi. And this guy's name is Dave, Dave. Bookbinder. And it, it's always a pleasure to have you on the program. Dave, it's and always a pleasure to be here with you guys. Thank you for Thank having you, uh, fun for us. And this time you're back as a co-host. I know you've collaborated with Cheryl in the past. You know her pretty well. You had a particular line of questioning right. you wanted to start this segment with, Dave. So maybe you could do that. Oh, Take it absolutely. Over. Hey, Cheryl. Thanks for being on the program with these guys. Hi. I wanted to ask you something uh, about a topic that you shared recently through your PBS series about perfectionism. I uh, wonder if you could tell the audience how, if, if you are an entrepreneur or an executive, how to overcome the fear that you have to be perfect. And the flip side of that is, what if you're an employee working for a perfectionist when you think about the resilience aspect of that? Those are great questions. That's terrific. Great. Yeah, very good question. In order to answer them, I'm going to take a step back for a moment. and share something I learned on my journey that's really been seminal in creating the ability to be resilient. So I I mentioned that I did in fact become a model after I was abducted by those criminals who Mm. pretended that they could make me one. Mm. And one of the places I went, you know, they they sent me all over the world, Paris, London, Milan, and then Tokyo. And while I was in Japan, the next stage of my journey unfolded, I kept to myself most of the time. I just, I was a loner, as you could imagine. I tried to keep very separate from people after experiencing that trauma. But uh, I, I would spend most of my time when I wasn't actually shooting something. I would spend my time in my agent's office. And in Japan, they revered, revered their elders. And my agent had her grandparents there all the time. In case she needed to make any very important decisions, she would call them in. And I was sitting in their conference room one day reading a book, like usual, and they had this large wooden table there that was kind of odd from my perspective. It was beautiful, but I'd never seen anything like it. It was wide at one end, as the tree must have been, and then narrowed at the other end, again, just like the tree must have been. Mm. And while it was beautiful, they left in all these big splits and splinters and divots. They, they, they busted a little bit so people wouldn't be splintered, but they left the eyes of the wood in and where the branches must have grown. There were kind of divots, and I was absentmindedly tracing my finger over one of these big holes, and the grandmother came in and said, oh, wabi-sabi. Hmm. And I thought, well, like, I didn't know what that meant. What's sabi? You know, like, was hmm. sashimi, sushi, and the time to eat? <laughs> and they said, no, 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 they giggled. And then the grandfather said, wabi-sabi is the most essential of all the Japanese principles. Because Wabi Sabi states that the beauty or perfection of any object lies in its flaws. Mm. So this table or anything else can only be seen to be perfect to a correlate degree to which it contains imperfections or flaws or ruined things. 
I had never heard anything like that. But, you know, as a cowgirl growing up, we certainly sure. were striving for imperfection. You know, as anybody, we strive for perfection, right? Mm-hmm. And immediately I wondered, could this apply to me? I had this deep, dark secret at pretending that, that nothing was wrong and, and I wasn't, as I thought, very flawed. But what I learned and have been applying ever since in my work is that we all strive for perfection and we try to present this front of having it all together when truly there's a whole other way to come at life, an entirely different context called Wabi Sabi, which is about looking for the things that make us unique. Unique trumps perfection any day. And when we get wrapped around the axle with trying to be perfect, it shuts down the space for everyone around us because perfection is impossible, let's face it. So if you yourself are trying to be perfect and have that as a standard, it kills off not only the, the affinity and the relationships of the people around you or the people that you manage, but it starts to shut down their ability to be productive and creative because when we're our most productive and creative and and full of growth is when we're kids and kids aren't afraid to afraid to fail Mm -hmm. they fall down they get back up they laugh about it they fall down they wipe out they laugh about it kids like even teenagers laugh about epic fails somehow when we get grown up we think it's the death knell to fail but rather we could look at our failures as one or a something funny and humorous. Well, I know when there's a lot riding on, on something and you got a financial at stake that's, that's hard to see, but bringing a little levity would be helpful. But there's the biggest chance for growth that we could ever experience. But once we, once we embrace imperfection as an access to something larger, it gives people around us a space to fail and therefore learn and grow and excel. Mm. If you look at the biggest growth that's ever happened in terms of organizations and invention, it was those people and places and, and enterprises that allowed for failure. Fail, 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 succeed, succeed, fail, succeed, fail, succeed, succeed, succeed. Wow. That's a learning curve we could all get behind. Right. But if we're stuck, in the perfection trap will never get there. Oh, that's... Thank goodness, I, I, Dave did mention I've been doing this, this new series, or not actually an old series for PBS called American Health Journal. It's been on since the 80s. But they have the foresight to realize that part of wellness overall is confronting things like this perfectionism trap. Well. I've just done 26 episodes of this series and it's, it's very helpful concepts like this. So, you know, you can check it out as well. It's, that is, a def- you know, we're coming up on a break after what I think ha- may be the most powerful, most valuable Absolutely. eight minutes of CEO chat we've ever had in the year we've been doing this. And before we take this break, I just kind of want to try to net out what I think I heard you say, Cheryl, and that is CEOs that define themselves by their strong advocacy and demanding of perfection are actually missing opportunities by not tolerating, accepting and building on some of the imperfections that they see around them. I think that's so powerful. We'll be, we'll be back with more CEO chat and more of a terrific guest, Cheryl Hunter, after these messages. We're back. We are back. Welcome back to CEO chat. This guy's name over here is Joe Asimendi. And that's Al Sini. It's my pleasure to be here with both of you, Dave Bookbinder. Hey, guys. Dave, welcome uh, aboard. Thank uh, you again. Cheryl, welcome back. And, and uh, I mean, there's so many valuable Thank lessons you. in talking with you. I, I know. I wanted to kind of start. The, I wanted to learn more about Cheryl Hunter and the Hunter Group. And I think maybe we'll start that by talking about your collaboration on the new ROI with Dave Bookbinder. Mm-hmm. So, Dave, what did you get out of working with Cheryl? And then we'll talk about how other people can connect, contact her and, and yeah. get. So, yeah, Cheryl was invaluable in, in helping us launch the new ROI series and ultimately the book. Uh, Cheryl talked a lot about resilience in the aspect of the business world. And we talked a little bit about that here earlier. Uh, we talked in the book about resilience in mergers and acquisitions. Uh, and how not only uh, teams are going through those issues, but how employees who may have to deal with the uncertainties, what's the difference between rumor and fact? And uh, Cheryl, I don't know if you want to weigh in on any of those topics at this moment. 
Yeah, I think it's important for our audience to get to know what the, what the Hunter Group does. Right. And so go ahead. This is your segment. Sure, absolutely. There, you know, all of those things point to a particular culture. And, and there's either a culture that, that fosters collaboration and creativity and, and ultimately the velocity with which an idea and a goal and a direction moves through an enterprise. And one, you know, on one side, if something gets stifled or stuck, and on the other side, something gets liberated, when people get liberated and empowered simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And I really, you know, one of the things that I've been focused on, I could see what a difference resilience was making for me all along to develop that, that resilience and buoyancy. But, it, you know, nothing matters if it's just one person, I thought. It, until I can give it away and see it replicated over time, nothing matters. And now I'm happy to say that you know, what my team and I work on is creating individuals who are empowered and get out of their own way, mm. which creates enterprises that get out of their own way and can move with real velocity. And the ability to create individuals and teams and organi or organizations that are able to flow from idea to execution and result without a stop, it, 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 it's counterintuitive because we look at it like, no, I just need to be perfect and then it'll all flow quickly. It, it's, that is the opposite is true. Mm. When we allow for the natural failure curve while still then buoying ourselves and our people up so that we don't get knocked down so easily, it sets everybody free to be, so they truly can be their, wow. their best and perform their best. Wow. And there's something about a culture that is pulling for that, where right. everybody wins and, can, can, and, and there's not a fear of failure that gives people the ability to move with un, at, at unprecedented speed. That and is... it's, 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 it's a privilege to empower people with that, because we like to say that, that our ability is to shortcut learning curves by 18 months. Mm. And if you realize, like, once you get out of your way, and that velocity really can take place. Right. And it's, it's just, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to empower people and organizations to move with that kind of velocity. Well, you know, it's our honor and privilege. Back, it yeah. forward, but it, it all turns out in the end. That is a terrific message. It's our honor and privilege to help you get it out there. And you know, it's as you were talking, I was thinking, we pride ourselves as a society in being able to create technology that makes better widgets than people do. But but the reality is, we can never build a machine that can make a difference the way people do. And it's that difference making, as imperfect as it might be, as uh, resilient as it needs to be. Uh, that you really help with. And I think that's such an important part of your value proposition. Talk a little bit about some of the clients you've worked with. I know you've worked with some pretty big companies. Yes, uh, lately it seems to be, uh, for whatever reason, I mean, you know, there's referrals are very strong business, but we, we seem to be within tech a lot. Um, and, you know, on all sides of that, but, but technology executives in particular coming to us wanting to create powerful teams and organizations and structures. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the things that personally, it, it makes me very happy is there seems to be a larger number of women than usual coming to, coming to us as well. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, who knows why that is, you know, people finding their voice, whatever, whatever the, the factors are, but it's, there's something, you know, initially I would hear from executives saying, oh, if I get sit, you know, one more, one more 21 year old executive coming in and just mm. gunning for my job. I don't know what I'm going to do about it. But once we started empowering them to be resilient in the face of whatever's coming up, mm. it's, it gives them a new relationship to all of it, where people are creating cultures of collaboration rather than competition. Mm. And, we all know how it is in the workplace. There's a whole lot of backstabbing that's possible and political jockeying. But when people are coming from collaboration, which is certainly an element that fosters resilience, wow. there's something that's electrifying about watching that really fall into place and be authentic. And, and 
you know, Wabi Sabi, the principle, which we like to infuse into our work, the principle allows for people to be authentic. Mm. And cultures of authenticity really flourish. And it's really a gift to create that in anything. I don't care if we're in tech, we're in automotive, we're in healthcare. Well. It's the same human dynamic. No, and that authenticity is, and resilience fosters. Well, yeah, well said. We're, yeah, that's terrific. We're coming up on the end of our program, Cheryl, and uh, I mean, we've talked about resilience, we've talked about managing perfection and our need for it, and realizing that there's beauty and imperfection. Uh, we've talked about empowering cultures of collaboration. There's so much value in, in your messages. Uh, here's your opportunity to tell everybody how to reach you and reach out to the Hunter Group to maybe get help with some of those things. Wonderful, sure. It's, our, our website is thehuntergroup.biz. And uh, I, I have a, I do a lot of national news appearances and things myself, and my website is CherylHunter.com. Yeah. Cheryl, I can't so thank you enough for appearing on our program. Books and things like this. Oh, it's I, well, you can find you can find Cheryl Hunter on Amazon. Uh, just do a search. She's written plenty of books. There's so much material out there. With uh, Cheryl as the author, you really need to look her up and get to know her, and maybe engage the Hunter Group and. It's been wonderful talking with you. I want to thank everybody for watching this episode of CEO Chat. Uh, my name is Al Sini. I'm still Joe Asimendi. And who are you? I'm you Dave are. Bookbinder. Cheryl, yeah. thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Cheryl, was a real my pleasure. pleasure. Thank you. Cheryl, we'll have a wonderful you. weekend, and thanks a lot. Yeah, we'll see you again on a future episode of CEO Chat. Mm -hmm. Thank you.